Congratulations. We go back uh, a number of years, and as someone who watched the World Series in 1986, as a 20-year-old, that's a memory that's, to this day, I can never forget. But considering what we're currently seeing in baseball today with pitchers, the impact that your father had, your high school coach had, from the standpoint of maybe not rushing you, progress to what we ended up experiencing in 1984, 1985, vintage got good. What would you tell a young boy today who wants to become a pitcher? What are some things along the line of conditioning and arm strength? I think, um, this might be, I was very fortunate to make very uh, knowledge that my father had that taught us about mechanics at a very young age. Um, he developed very with his hand, he developed me as a pitcher. The main thing is, I would say number one is young pitcher, have fun. That's the most important thing. And to me, what separates the good players from the great players is always ask kids all the time. When you don't have practice, when you don't have games, what can you do to make yourself better? There's a lot of distractions now for kids, unfortunately. And having passion for the game. I mean, you've got to eat, drink, and sleep baseball. And understanding, understanding what it takes to even wear a uniform. I mean, even young kids, it's a privilege to wear a uniform because somebody goes to parents who ever paved the way for you to get to that point. And just put in the hard work. And I would say, um, boys throwing, I think the parents played a big part in that, for the monitoring the kids. And a lot of times you notice where sometimes the parents try to live their dream through the kid instead of letting the kid be the kid. So that would be my advice, pretty much. Just my opinion. Ali? Hey, John. Can you recall your reaction the first time you saw that girl? Oh, wow. Um, I tell you, um, you want the truth or? Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, I said it because. 
because you know I was, I was young. I was 20 years old when that happened. And going in the city, um, a lot of times you ride by there intentionally, but whoever's the passenger, you know, you can tell like this is the first time seeing it. <laughs> so I think it's lucky a lot of times, you know. But honestly, um, the first time I saw that, I was overwhelmed. You know, being 20 years old, 20 years old and seeing that, you know, my family came up to take them by there and enjoy that. Um, the same, you know, surreal. You know, I didn't know how to take it, but then it was any career, but then it's not going so well on the field. You look like that and you really get to enjoy it. And now when I see the pictures up and everything, and I show my grandkids, it means a lot. But the first time I saw it, I was overwhelmed by it. Mark? Uh, I know from Stephen Hugh as well, when you talked to him, said that one of the biggest regrets of your life was this time to take a full parade. Um, today, does that use some of that regret? Well, I, I forgive myself for that. It was a thing that I spoke with for a long time because it was something that happened that you can't really do. When you see your teammates, the guys that you play with, something that we worked so hard for, celebrating, celebrating the fans not there. Unfortunately, it kept me sick for a long time. But I had to get to a place where I could forgive myself and move on from that. And I have done that. But yeah. today, I don't think about the career. I just think about where I'm at today. I remember. Being healthy, um, mentally and physically, and having my friends, my family here to celebrate with me. It's going to mean a lot to me, too. John? Yeah, just help me follow up on that. Just a little bit, Doc. You've been, you've been very good and very candid about your off-field problems. And obviously, you had a great career for uh, the D3 War. Uh, you were the best player in baseball when you were 20 years old. Uh, do you ever allow yourself to think about what might have been? I mean, obviously, it's a great career, but good thing to be better. Well, you know what? That's a great question. But the thing is, those are things that the expectations that Others have me, you know, as I mentioned earlier, growing up with Gary, all I dreamed about was playing to make leagues, playing a long time, staying healthy, hopefully one day when the World Series. Um, then my career got to a great start. Um, unfortunately, everything was compared to whatever I did in 85, I said, far so high. And in 86, I'll be lying to say, I let the game slip away a little bit because it wasn't as fun because I was used to you know, test strike outs, shout out the game. That did step back in the I got to be thankful for the things I did accomplish and not worry about the things that did happen. Um, and not to go smoke, but I wanted to inspire everyone as I did. I wanted to register for your team. Um, I mean, I'm retired. Last year, I got to go to the gym all the game. I have nothing to be ashamed of about my career. Thank you. I've got a celebration. I'm very proud of you. Mike? Doc, uh, when did you find out? Daryl was going to be here, and what does it mean to you that he, he was able to make it? Oh, man. I didn't know until I see him today. You know, um, we, we, we text each other, we talk. I didn't know he could be here today. It's good to see Daryl. You know, it'll always be Daryl and Dr. Dr. Daryl. We'll always be connected. And to see Daryl, I mean, I'm just as happy for him, the things he's accomplished in his life, first as a man, when he's got going his ministry. It's very proud of him. Because I know Daryl is a person. Um, Obviously, we've had ups and downs. Things happen. So when we are close, we don't have those things. But we've been in front of I think we're closer now. And to see Daryl, when I saw him, I was very happy to see him, man. It just brought joy to me that he took out the opportunity to make it here today to join his day with me as well. And when he had this day, Jewel first, I'll be just as excited for him as that for myself. Danny? Uh, just to piggyback off of that question, how about the rest of your teammates? Did you expect to see this? I think it's a great, I love these guys, man. And, you know, we, we play with guys for so long, we spend more time with these guys than you know, family. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about it, you develop a great relationship, a friendship, you develop a great bond. And we had talked earlier about the amazing comments that came song here Friday. Yo, what? Yo. Show my idea and got me in. And now 
attention. The first thing I go out to fish and I see my dad and my mom sitting on the stairs. See my parents sitting in the stairs, you know. It was big, big playing professional baseball, the gear would tell you. It was my dad's family, of course. My dad did it at first, it became my dream. And I see my parents sitting on the stands, seeing their joy on their face. And I remember Bill Dorn rounding out the second. Um, I would say Terry Poole rounding out the second. And I got to get on struck out. Walking off the field after that first struck out, that's when you feel the confidence and the feel the swag and the walk at the time. And um, just to see the joy and muscle on my dad's face um, meant everything to me. Unfortunately, the next start in Chicago, I got knocked out in the third So, I go from saying that the date you're ready to the next start, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, but it became better as I got to know you guys, got comfortable. Jay Hart has been a big part of that, especially in 485. Um, spring training in 84, once I made the team, you all made the team, Daryl F. Lani. Um, the first two years we just lived together. Um, not lived together, but his neighbors at Fort Washington, we used to drive to the ballpark together. So he talked to me a lot about doing the media, showing up to in front of your locker room and that. He helped me out a lot because of what he went through the previous year. Ed, in the back. Yeah, so Nolan, um, Dwight, um, obviously you pitched a lot of big games here, and your battery mate for most of that time was Gary Carter. And what was it like playing with him, and, and, and what did he mean to your career on a day-to-day -day basis? Gary was great. Um, not only a great catcher, but you guys know, but a great friend, and just a great guy. Um, Gary, when, in 84, when I met Gary, in all star game, I remember after the first inning going into the dugout, and Gary said, wouldn't this be nice to do every fifth day? Not knowing was going to trade for Gary that November, and we just hit it off right away. Gary's one of the guys where the only catcher I ever had besides Barry that would catch me between starts. He wanted to be totally locked in, and Gary, like, there was no coincidence that I had the year I had in 1985. Gary played a huge part of that. Gary wanted me to dominate every game. I mean, if it was up 10 nothing, he wanted me to pick like it was 1 nothing. He wanted the complete game, he wanted 10 plus rush outs, he wanted to shut out, and he demanded nothing but the best, and I had a lot of respect for Gary. Especially at, when it was towards the end, he would get to the ballpark 12 o'clock in the afternoon for a 7 o'clock game. He could work with his knees. I mean, he's the last guy to leave after the game, get a treatment on his knees. I mean, I don't think um, from our pitching staff, we would have had the success we had in 5 days, 6 12 with Gary about the leadership that he brought. And the man that Gary was, he speaks volumes. Andrew? Uh, what you mentioned a lot about uh, just sharing this day with your grandkids and your kids. I guess to the younger generation, how do you kind of explain the legacy that you had on, on the mound? 
Well, I think they, they'll get, well, if they're too young, um, some of them are too young. It's like all ages with grandkids, but they'll get the experience what it was like a little bit when I pitched in the parking lot next door. Uh, I think it's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all this said, because to me, this is still shade. It's like the new shade, right? <laughs> no disrespect to anybody, but that is me. Um, my two younger kids, I was married twice. My youngest son, Dylan, who's at the University of Maryland football, but I remember when he was playing Little League, um, he never seen me play. He only saw me play the old timers games with the Yankees. And one day he came over and he said, Dad, I want to pitch. I said, okay, we'll start working on that. And he said, what do you know about pitching? <laughs> <laughs> and I had to show him tapes. And the only way he found out that we got pitched was because of his teammates' parents would tell their kids, and then they would tell him. And now, he understands a little bit now, but to do it, I'm just dad. But it's, it's great just to share his point with him. Doc, which grandson are you throwing first pitch to? Oh, uh, Caden, my nephew and grandson. Yeah. He played a little league of tackle. Doc, um, your number, when you look at it up there, who's going to be next to Willie Mazes and just down the block from Tom Seaver? I wonder if you can process that and, and maybe mention what you need to do, especially those players. I mean, obviously, it means a great deal to me. Saber was a good friend of mine. I got to know Tom a little bit. And just to be in that, in that, that, um, that situation with those guys, it means a great deal. And not only that, but I look at it as, obviously, my numbers go up there, but I'm the guy that's going up there. But it's for all of us, because it don't happen without these guys. My teammates have uh, been there as well. It's a great honor be up there, you know, like to say that one of the highest honors for me and, and makes it really for well, everybody who really, I got to know really a little bit. Um, it means a great deal. But just to have a number up there among those guys is really a lot. Mike? I trained in 1984 with Huggard Siegel, the same team. And me and Mike, we just connected. And the thing I'm, I'm not most about Mike that I would like to told Mike is, he said to me that when I made the team, he said, once you start pitching well, or I'm talking about young guys start pitching well, you're probably going to get rid of me, me and him, uh, Craig Swan, Dick Tim, all these guys. Well, as long as I'm here, I'm going to help you. There's been a lot. There's a lot of guys who are going to do that. And I remember, um, after every start I had, back then we had a lot of B games at Huggins Stable. After every start of going, the media would say, well, some of you guys are there, you say, the Frogs wants to go to WA Triple A. And Mike and I had both the wrist when Mike lost confidence with Mike. And we were talking about last night, he would say, uh, I said, Mike, they think about saying, we're down. He would say, you know, what? Go in there and tell them you're not going down. You know, he said, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually told Davey, I said, Davey said, I said, Mike said I'm not going down. <laughs> 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 Well, you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, I told him Mike said it. I didn't say it, but <laughs> after, after I made the team, me and Mike would go out and eat on the road, and I was sitting next to Mike. We went pitching, and I went pitching. We just talked about setting up hitters, reading bat speed, what you look for in hitters, and sometimes you quiz me, what you throw here, why you throw this here. So I have a lot of respect for Mike, and we developed a great relationship by doing that. And unfortunately, they did release me. Um, I think June, maybe. Yeah. Um, but we always stay in contact, and we still in contact today. I'm glad you're here. It's good to see you. First, Doc, what's your message to the youth of today about baseball and life? Baseball life? I would say, well, when I know some about having fun, I think you've got to have fun. And when I say to kids, when you cancel acquaintances, not everybody can make it, but you develop friendships that last a lifetime. And I think that's more than anything. If you use teammates, like a lot of guys make it, going to corporate America as co-workers, you know, enjoying the game, respecting the game, um, respecting our power, respecting the coaches, the teammates, whatever. And I always tell them, like, sometimes if you feel like you're struggling, and this is what we're if you feel like you're struggling, try to do one thing to help the team win that day. Forget about your personal stats, personal accomplishments. Do something to help your team that day that way out and not thinking so much about yourself. I would say the main thing for the youth is having fun. John? You 
Uh, I think a combination of both. That's why I keep saying, and it probably sound cheating, I keep saying it's a celebration, because celebration of my career as well as my life off the field. Um, honestly, I don't think I would be here today without the support and my fans, my family, teammates, with all the text messages, all the you know, social media stuff that I get to keep me going. Um, when I go down or struggling or going through something, you know, if, if, if no people care for you, it just gets you to that, that moment to get like to love yourself again. So that plays a big part in obviously my career. The fans have been here with me from day one to eighty four. Get to reminisce of my career and celebrate that as well. So I think that's a combination of both. Uh, Anthony McLean from uh, MLBGrow.com. Congratulations, first of all. Talk about the uh, phone call from uh, Steve Cohen. You said that uh, you thought it was just going to be a regular conversation, but it wound up being letting you know that you were going to get the number retired. Talk a little bit about that. Yes. Um, initially, Jay had called me, Jay Horace, and told me that Steve was trying to reach me. And okay, um, I didn't know it was all from a job or <laughs> what it was, but when he called, you have maybe a thought that that could be it, but when I talked to him, at first you think it might be a prank call. We have a lot of pranks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't know, because I never talked to Steve on the phone before, so, before, so you don't know what you're getting. But when I knew it was him, we had that conversation. I mean, at the moment, it just, it didn't really hit me at first, but then when it hit, that was what he said to me, like I said earlier, it was something that you want to share with your dad, but unfortunately he's not here. And um, the next call went to my family. I started calling my family. I didn't know what's going on. what's going to take place. Me and Darrell had a conversation as well. And, you know, I think it still didn't really start hitting in until the last couple of weeks as we started getting closer with the momentum. It started hitting, and now it's here. Um, so I'm just going to try to soak it all in and just enjoy it as much as the fans can enjoy. Last one. Yes. Doc, um, number 16, was that the number you wanted? Was that your favorite number? And talk about when you went to the Yankees, why did you fall off and his number 16? Yeah, so that's gonna be part of my speech today, but I'll give it to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll give it to you guys. I'm going to fill the team guys in here. So, <laughs> uh, I get drafted in '82. I go to Kingsport, Tennessee. Um, was, my number was I like the number five. I like number ten. That's what I wore in high school. There was a guy, Russ Ford. I never forget this guy. He had been in rookie ball for like three years. Three years in rookie ball, and he was like, I don't care who you are. You know, you want to pretend you're not getting it. And back then, if you draft like in the first couple rounds, they call you bonus baby. And he was like, I don't care who you are, you are bonus baby. You're not getting my <laughs> so I told the trainer, give me something close to 10, but not 13. Uh, he gave me 16. So I took 16, and next year I go to 8 ball. I'm in Lynchburg. 16 is called by the same 16. 84, obviously, I make the team. Spring training, I'm wearing number 64. I make the team. We have a workout before we open up in Cincinnati, I believe. And I go to my locker and it's number 35, hanging up a big number. And so I see nobody's got 16. And I remember once I made a team, Frank Cash and the general manager told him I got any problem with anybody, just come see him. And I went to Charlie, I went to Charlie Law because I said, Charlie, can I get 16? He was like, no, get out of here, kid. Just be happy you're on the team. <laughs> <laughs> so so like, I was the poor kid I was, I went to Frank's office. Frank, I want 16, Charlie won't give it to me. <laughs> Frank came down, told Charlie to give Doc 16. That's how I got 16, but come to find out, the reason why Charlie won't give me 16 was because of me in Brazil. He wore 16, and him and Charlie were good friends. Um, and 86, Lee rejoined until we got Lee, and I told Lee, you're 16, you have it back. He said, no, it's your number, you can have it now. And when I went to the Yankees, as you mentioned, Whitey Ford, Often you get 16, but there's no way I'll put 16 out there. Thanks, Zach. Number 16, Jim Hall. Yo quiero que te suscribas a las cinco esquinas. Bueno, bueno.